What's going on, guys? It's your boy, Burrow77, coming to you with Josh Lander, who I am happy to have back on the program. Uh, we've both been mad busy covering different ends of the basketball spectrum, but I am very excited to have Josh on for the college basketball show because um, everybody's talking college hoops. I know it's a little dead right now, and people are itching for some afternoon gambling action. I would have loved to give you some soccer stuff, but they're on international break and that actually works out super well for me because now I don't have to do the La Liga show with that US on Thursday. I can just relax, crack some beers at noon and dive into the madness. So yeah. I'm really excited about that. Uh, how about you, Josh? Same dude. Same. Yeah. I, uh, I'm preparing myself for a day on Thursday for sure. Like it, I don't, it's one of those things where it's like when you go to like, you know, a wedding weekend or something, it's like, you, you can't go too hard at the rehearsal dinner the night before. Cause then the next night you're spent for, so like, I'm going to maintain my cool, you know, but day drinking is, is awesome for that exact reason. Right. And some live betting college March madness. Like I, yeah, I, I got some plans for it, man. I'm ready. Yeah. And I also want to say, um, up top, talk about a lot of different uh bets off the rip um guys you you gotta make sure you shop around your sports books everybody's giving great promos a lot of these positions i'm talking about are valuable because of the different boosts we're getting they have live boosts and all sorts of stuff i'll be on twitter most of the time um while I'm watching, I have four screens set up at my apartment so I can watch four games at once, which is going to be awesome. But yeah, I mean, I'll be live tweeting plays and stuff like that. So be sure to follow along and catch me there if you're looking for positions to use your sort of live boosts and different offerings on. And um, let's just jump right into it. I'm going to go right into my round of six or my round of 64 bets. I have action down on. I got money down on all of these. Then Josh and I are going to jump into a little bit of bracket breakdown and chop it up about, you know, teams. I know he's a UConn fan. We got to We got to talk about that. So uh, we'll just jump right into the round of 64 action. I already have down and then stick around for at the end. We'll talk about futures positions and a couple of different boosts I like and spots to use that aren't even really long futures positions. Like the Sweet 16 wraps up Sunday at the latest. So right. a lot of these bets will be cashing on Saturday and Sunday afternoon. So right. that's not a long time to wait on a futures position. I love that, dude. Yeah, I love that you're 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 coinciding it with the 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 bets that you have here with the, some of these boosts since there's so damn many of them. And then yeah, I, I love the futures positions that you hold. That was were very profitable for me to tail in the conference tourneys. So yeah, yeah, it was great. The uh, the big conference tourney video, um, what was it? I made six futures plays. Three of them got to the championship game. Our lowest return on investment was like 40% for a chalky kind of one. Yeah. Uh, then 150% and almost 500% on the Florida bet. And we're going oh, yeah. back to Florida, which we'll get to. But yeah, let's do it. Let's uh, Let's start off right here. And I'm starting with a player prop, and that's not usually a big thing for me. But I got to talk about this matchup Ryan Kalkburner from Creighton has versus Akron. Akron barely made the tournament because a kid on Kent State lost his mind, forgot they were up one, and fouled on the final possession, uh, sending Akron to the tournament in eight-seed Kent State who upset number one seed Toledo, ended up staying home over that brain fart. And you really have to feel for the kid. But the thing here is Akron's tallest player on the court is six foot nine. Ryan Kalkburner is seven foot one, and he has excellent touch around the rim. My biggest problem with Kalkburner is he doesn't put in a ton of effort on the offensive glass, and some nights is even lackluster on the defensive glass. And let's a guard like who is tall, like Baylor Shireman, come down with a ton of his rebounds. But listen, Cogburner, you're a full, what, five, six inches above the tallest player on Akron here. I'm really hoping Creighton doesn't settle for outside shots and they just keep feeding this massive mismatch of a human being, Ryan Cogburner, in the post. I love taking his over 17 and a half points, which is minus 110 on DK and MGM. 
It's minus 114 on FanDuel, a little heavier juice on a couple other books. Um, but I think that he is regularly capable of getting 20 points in a row. And for a big man at seven foot one, dude's got ice in his veins from the free throw line. So I'm not worried about him getting sent to the line. He converts his free throws at an incredibly high rate for a guy who's seven one. So that's something I'm not worried about here. Now, I did say that he is kind of lackluster with his effort on the glass at both ends of the floor, but especially the offensive side of the floor. Again, my my idea here is the guy's seven foot one. Akron's tallest guy, even if he's got a lot of heart and, and he's got, you know, Charles Barkley level of rebounding skills for a dude who's incredibly undersized, but has that cake down low where he can box you out. You're seven one, dude. Just go like this. Come on, Thanks. my guy. Um, so I think eight rebounds at minus one twenty four is a decent number. I don't love like minus one thirty five and minus one forty five. That's up on DK and MGM. I think this is an advantageous number here on FanDuel. And then I went ahead and took a little sprinkle on a combo ladder for him to go twenty and ten. His 20 and 10 is plus 441. And I think that's a ton of value for a guy that's just got a lot of weight and size on um, no disrespect to the Mac. I watch a lot of Mac basketball. I live adjacent to Western's campus. I go to a lot of Mac games, but Carl Burner should feast here. There's, there's nobody stepping to him pound for pound. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I mean, I'm taking a look at some of his, his recent numbers too. Uh, the, the rebounds for him actually usually not going to get there when he's playing the better teams. So I think there is a little bit of correlation between him just size. Like you said, like you, you don't have to try that hard if you've got five inches on the next tallest dude on the other team. And even when that dude's out, uh, now you're looking at, you know, maybe some six, eight action as well down low for Akron. So, yeah, I don't see anything from Akron that would lend you to go like this. This is going to be a team rebounding affair or anything. It's just Cockbrenner. If he's not going to the three point line, which the only games he's really stepping out too far uh, are the games where he is playing like some some worse competition. But I think on defense, especially in this one, like he's not going to be drawn out in any way. And if, even if they try to draw him out, I'm sure that they'll figure out a way to keep him next to the basket and just use that size to their advantage. So, yeah, no, no problem with the, the Cockbrenner one. I love that we started with him. We talked about him last time I was on, too, and he slammed for yeah. us. So, Yep, that's what I was going to say. I was going to say if, uh, if ever, anybody remembers back to day one, my first video here, we took Cockburner because of a bad injury to Bryce uh, Bryce Hall on Providence. And Cockburner yeah. came through for us huge climb in the ladder and got that 10-20 for us. And that's why we're going back to him again here. I just see that same sort of mismatch with Akron. Yeah. Um, so and that's he might, why we're going he might, back he might to him. damn well play the whole game, honestly. Like, yeah. he, he's getting at least like 37 at least in this one. So, Yeah, and I um, – I, I, this was my pivot to go away from Creighton minus 12 and a half. It's not that I, I don't like that number. It's just walked out a little far for me. Earlier in the week, I was catching that around like minus 10 and a half. And let's be honest, you guys want to talk about bets you can take today. Nobody wants to listen to me talk about the CLV I got on um, Monday night because I am a fiend and I had my sports books apps open while the bracket was dropping. So yeah, um, yeah. nobody cares about that stuff and we'll keep it moving yep. to the next one, which is I'm kind of fading a public favorite, a little public darling here by taking South Carolina on the money line. And I'm willing to lay the minus 115 to do it. Um, you got a little bit better price earlier in the week if you jumped on this early. I know there's a lot of steam behind this Oregon team. Um, my biggest problem with Oregon is they struggle a ton from the free throw line. I don't think South Carolina is going to put them ver there very often. South Carolina played, a, I want to say, a much tougher schedule. I rate the SEC a lot higher than I rate the Pac-12. But Oregon does have some good wins. They do have some decent road wins. My problem is I just I hate backing teams that shoot as poorly as Oregon does from the free throw line. Now that South Carolina is like miles better, but South Carolina has been just road cover wagons all season. And it doesn't matter who they're playing. They cover the number extremely well against on the road. They've beaten big teams like Tennessee, who does have their own sort of weaknesses, but 
I, I think this is just too short of a number here on a South Carolina team that might have played not their greatest basketball heading into the SEC tournament, but I do think locks in and dials it up here and gives these Oregon the Oregon Ducks a problem. Yeah. I think it makes sense. What's interesting too about the, the SEC, you know, there there isn't there doesn't seem to be quite as much like home court advantage going on. I don't I don't want to like make some jump you know wild statement that like SEC doesn't have great home court advantage anywhere. Uh, but I, and I actually have been to a South Carolina game uh, in Charleston, and they're pretty fire. Like they're super fun. As a, as a Mizzou fan, was a little less fun, but still went after it. Uh, and either way though, the fact that like I do like to look for this during turn, tournament time is like. Can we kind of put something on the idea that if, if you don't need home court advantage and you're a good road team, uh, then are you going to do, do you have a little bit more success? And like even according to Ken Palm, it does seem to be the case uh, where like if home court advantage is a little bit less important to you, you actually are uh, going to do a little bit better historically in the tournament in general. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, call it what you want in terms of road or whatever at this point once we get to these neutral sites. But uh, more importantly, I, yeah, I think it, everything you said is, is spot on about them not being Oregon, not being able to keep up with them at that point. Yeah, and the next one I like here, too, is a little bit of an upset, and I am using a DraftKings promo on it. Um, DraftKings has the Colin Cowherd's upset no sweat bet, um, which I think is really good. You can take anyone from a 10 to a 16 seed on the money line for up to 25 bucks, which is a half unit for me. Um, and if they lose, you get your cash back. And I think that this is a really nice use of the boost in a tight game because Dayton is good, but they're not playing their best basketball at the right time of the season. Dayton's gotten cold and they don't look super awesome. The, the thing I did learn with Brandy that I was talking about is I do mess with Deron Holmes a ton. I think he's got NBA level talent and, and might be able to take the next step there. He is a big man, but he can shoot. He can step out and play on the perimeter. So he plays, he can play a three at times. He's primarily a four and a stretch four. Um, but at the college level, he does have the height and the, not the size at the NBA level to play five, but like a true five in college is dead. He's or in the NBA is dead and only really exists in college. So like, I'm not going to take Deron Holmes over a guy like Edie or a guy like Klingman on UConn who are like true fives. But this guy has like the NBA talent, uh, shooting, soft touch, ability to step out and stretch the floor. Is a stretch four um, and is a really good, good player who is from the state of Arizona. And if they win this game, could be matched up against Arizona. So March is kind of half narrative plays and half like... You know, what do you really see on the floor? I like this Nevada team a lot. I think that John Lucas is a supremely underrated player. He shoots over 90% from the free throw line. Nevada is really good at drawing contact and getting to the line. So what ends up happening is they have a guy in Blackshear who has insane NBA level talent for everything you need to do as a guard, except for knocking down your free throws. He's a sub 65% free throw shooter um, and, and flirted with like 60% on the season and a couple of times this season. And that just doesn't cut it at the NBA level for a guard. So that's something he needs to improve on. But the point is, that Dayton's going to have to double Lucas on the inbound once Nevada gets to the bonus, because they will get to the bonus. They're excellent at drawing contact, going to the rim. So you're going to have to double Lucas, leaving Blackshear open, who is a playmaker. He makes a lot of assists. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how Dayton handles the late game foul situation there with Blackshear. I think this is going to be a tight one. And even though it's minus 120, I think this is a good use of the DK insurance promo. I'm normally more of a fan of taking dogs, but the DK insurance promo won't even work for a team like New Mexico, who is an 11 seed, but is minus two against Clemson and minus 145 to minus 150 on the money line, which again, they should be eligible for this promo, but because the public and everybody knows that Clemson's super overinflated, they're everyone's 11 seed darling and you can't use the promo on them. So I don't have another great sort of so longer good. seed matchup that I'm keyed in on besides this Nevada line. So I do think it's a good use of the promo here. I, I feel that. 
Um, I, I kind of have something that I'm thinking too, because I read a pretty awesome article that's super relevant to this, uh, from, from a dude who I would highly suggest following online as well for, uh, for college basketball, Brad, uh, hold on, let me make sure you, oh, Brett, I'm sorry, Brett Gibbons. I've been following Brett. I always call him Brad. Uh, but Brett Gibbons had, had a really good article that he was writing where he was looking at how teams that were getting picked, uh, at a pretty high percentage, despite not having quite as as good of a win rate uh percentage that in terms of expectation uh and so some of these like higher seeds like yeah uh basically clemson has gotten picked so much at this point uh to your you know to what you were saying that like you you can't really get any uh value at this point from this stuff but the, a couple other teams that uh that i would consider if they are dogs now i would have to double check still uh the movement on them but uh, i got you i got that big board yeah. up oh. okay dope so like uh i think you can well i think you can still get some some uh value from colorado state uh, winning their matchup there. 25% is the pick percentage right now on like, this is basically gathered from like most of the important stuff like ESPN, Yahoo, all the more popular uh, brackets that you're going to find. And then uh, that that was one that I actually could see as well. And then I, I think UAB might've gotten picked out, uh, picked enough that they're not, they don't get quite as much value from them as the start, um, but they still have a decent win rate compared to the amount of picks that have been made on them. And last one that I love to bring up is Samford because of uh of kansas just being always vulnerable in that 413 and i love talking about it uh so that is as a mizzou fan just full transparency here someone who went to the school so i, I would say that's another decent one where it's like yeah you, you don't want to shell out too much but if you're still getting some good plus money on sanford i love the possibility of them coming uh coming out of the first round yeah you're actually getting great value on sanford they're plus seven and a half point dogs um i i Listen, I know Kansas has the injury issues that we covered last night with Brandy. Um, I'm not sure if Hunter Dickinson's going to be able to go. Um, their other guy, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but Brandy uh, broke the news last night. He's officially ruled out for the season, will not play in the tournament at all. Kansas has no depth. They play nobody off their bench. They're really just a starting five in a six-man only team. Yeah. So if you take away those two guys, uh, I think Brandy said that's an average of 36 points a game leaving the floor, which is massive. And Samford is a really tough, scrappy program. So I can see that here. We'll get into that a little bit more oh, yeah. in the futures picks because I do have something along that nature when we do get to the bracket there. Um, I also like your UAB pick. Um, Brandy's high on UAB. She's taking them with the points. I think they have a legitimate chance. They are playing great basketball right now as eight and a half point dogs. Uh, if you like them on the money line to play a San Diego State team that I want to say got caught sleeping, but like struggled, I guess, to close out the season. And, and it's tough to say that because the Mountain West was so deep um, and, and competitive. They made it to the Mountain West um, championship game. Um, and yeah, I, I just think, um, yeah, San Diego state might be a little overinflated and, and UAB is a very tough draw for them. So I can see that if you'd like a long shot. Um, and then Colorado state is a play in team. Again, one of the trends I think we were talking about last night with Brandy. And I think That's I said to you is a play in team always finds a way to win a game. I want to say it's in 10 of the last since the inception, all but one year, 11, 12, a play in yeah. team is yeah. Found a way to win a game. So if you like Colorado State against Texas to be that playing team, yeah. that's a ton of value and another great place to use that boost. Yeah, so, love it. Great points there. Um, Washington State on the money line at plus 105. I talked about this kind of ad nauseum the last two days, so I'll be quick with it. Listen, uh, Drake is good, and it was awesome to see them in. We'll talk about Indiana State and their tournament snub here in a minute uh, because Virginia completely laid an egg. Um, but look, the, the thing here is Drake plays small ball and Washington is the second tallest team in all of the NCAA. I think their length is going to give Drake a lot of problems, especially if you're looking for separation on mid-range and three-point shots. I think Drake's really best way to win this game is to go to the paint and try and draw contact and shoot free throws, which again, I think is going to be difficult against a Washington state team. Who's just really long. And one of Drake's biggest things is they get after the glass, which is great. Um, but again, we're measuring against a lot of Ohio Valley competition, whereas Wazoo played in what I guess you can say, I'll say is a little, 
overrated Pac-12 slash overinflated Pac-12 slash the death of the Pac-12, but like it's still the Pac-12 and you're still giving up mad inches at every single position on the floor and Washington State's good on the glass as is. So I think that Drake, well, they are a great story and I would love to see them Cinderella here. I'm getting way too much value at plus money on a Washington State team that's just, you know, three, four inches clear of them on every position at the yep. floor. Yep, 100%. That, that's going to come that, – that matters, right, at this time of the, of the year. So I, I fully I fully with that. Yeah, I love finding the the little instances where it's like, well, what if they just need a bucket? What <laughs> This is the time of year it's like, what if they just need one bucket? What, what's going to be easier? Is having, yep. like, you know, two dudes down low that are going to at least have an advantage in one of those spots each time with, with who you put on them. So, yeah, I, I love finding that advantage and getting that plus money. Yeah, and keeping it moving – and we'll keep this one quick. New Mexico, they're everybody's darling. They are grossly underrated as an 11 seed. Clemson lost to the likes of Notre Dame, Wake Forest, and Boston College in three of the four coming into this tournament. Clemson's here because they play in the ACC and it's the name on the front of the jersey. They don't deserve to be a six seed. New Mexico borderline meets the Ken Palm criteria of being a national championship caliber team. They do have two stud freshmen that I get it. Some people are hesitant to back freshmen, especially in the tournament here, but there's a reason that Sharps and the public are all over this New Mexico team and that they're a minus two as an 11 to beat the six Clemson, who's just playing garbage basketball right now and can't take care of the rock at all against a Clemson team who loves picking your pocket and turning your up turning you over so clemson's yep. ball security issues here are a massive issue yep i'm with it keeping it moving i i'm gonna fully admit it i flopped uh after talking to brad and brandy i got talked off of the texas a&m and i'm buying into the tommy yagu the japanese international steph curry um and i'm taking nebraska on the money line while i can still get it at minus 110 and i don't have to pay any more juice so this line opened up with Texas A&M being about two point favorites. Um, this is slid to a pick em, and it's sliding to Nebraska being the favorite. They're about minus one, minus one and a half right now. So if you shop around, I took this on Caesars where I could still get it at minus 110. I'd be fine laying minus 115. I'm probably not going to step out to minus 120. So get your action in now. Get it in today because the more this Tamiyagu story blows up, the more people are going to buy into this Nebraska team because the kid can flat out hoop and he's played NBA level competition by playing in the Olympics and playing for the Japanese national team. Like yep. there is something to be said for playing FIBA ball as a youth and and coming in and being a spark plug in, in just draining threes for this Nebraska team who all season I have been hard on. They struggle on the road. They drop winnable games like they did versus Rutgers. Um, so yeah, they, they've struggled on the road, but they're just getting hot at the right time. And I feel like this story of Tommy Agu is blowing up and it is going to influence the money. So I would highly recommend getting your money down today instead of waiting for tomorrow where you're going to be buying at a premium. Love it. I love it. Yep. Last one, uh, or not last one, but what last two I want to talk about is I'm picking my spot in my uh, 512 up seat that seeds here i think jmu stands a much better chance at beating scani than grand canyon does at beating saint mary's i think saint mary's is getting hot at the right time i am on video talking hella shit on saint mary's this season so i have to reverse that stance and i will own it and i'll back saint mary's here uh scani are frauds they can't shoot outside of their building so why would i think they can shoot on a neutral court and they struggle to shoot in their own building some nights here so I do think JMU covering the plus five and a half here is a nice little price. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to find some way to back Grand Canyon. I really did just because it's them. Uh, but I, yeah, I can't, I can't do it. I'm, I'm with you on this one too. They do play a tough brand of basketball and they do play yeah. a tough defense. It's just they don't, they don't play anybody that's as good as St. Mary's or has yeah. 
the players St. Mary's does. So yep. I think that JMU is the better 5-12 upset seed spot, Dang in it. my opinion. Because JMU's done it already. They beat Michigan State. So, like, yep. I, I just think JMU has a little bit better of a resume. That matters now, yeah. We'll keep it moving into the brackets because we got to talk to Josh, who is a massive UConn guy, because um, – I didn't want to use the word rigged. And when I talked to Brad, I used the phrase gerrymandered. So (laughs) I think that's better. And it has less implications that there's some sort of, I want to say conspiracy, but it's not like an anti-gambling thing. I think when people say rigged, they associate it with like fixed games. And, And that's not what this is. I think this is just... They gave you they gave UConn the hardest possible bracket to try and be back-to-back national champs. And we yeah. haven't had back-to-back national champs since Florida did it in 07. Shout out my boy Joe Kim Noah, because yeah, that man was an absolute monster, and that Florida him. team was insane. Um, Take them both so, years in my bracket. Both I did awesome, I swear dude. on everything. I love that team. Yeah, I love Torian Green, Lee Humphrey. Uh, Al Horford, y- Yokim, like, oh my God. I mean, I didn't even say Corey Brewer. Like, they were stacked, dude. Absolutely stacked. I love that squad. That team was super nasty. And then you combine that with they're also the last college team to ha- win both a uh, football and an NCAA yeah. basketball tournament yeah. in the same year. Like, talk about what a great year it was to it's be silly. in Florida and a Florida student. The swamp was lit. Okay. It was lit. And, but, and, you know, impressively about this UConn team, they are still only the, the only school to uh, to have the men and women win in the same year. So, I mean, something to be said for that as well in just in terms of college bas- basketball dominance. But I think that's a pretty solid segue into, look, you're talking, I, I, I originally born in New York, but, you know, grew up in Connecticut. And it's like, that's your pro team. So, I mean, as someone, you know, you probably know a thing or two about that at times right it, when when you're in a small in a state that doesn't have any pro teams right like there's plenty of them in those flyover states as well where it's like all right so this is this is everything is college hoop and for, for where i'm at though is still objectively like i get it and i do want to say i actually don't think that the committee does this type of thing on purpose every year like i'm not sure once they come to their conclusions about who's in then it's just like all right now it's a puzzle that's got to be fixed out and someone's going to be mad so i really would not attribute malice to something that can just be account- accounted for by ignorance, which is like yeah. the best they could do. You know what I mean? There wasn't there wasn't any purpose to it. That said, if there was going to be a theory behind why this is, my guess would be the NCAA and ESPN. I mean, they're not. I don't think they're the most cordial of partners, to be honest with you. And there's a couple things going into that. I mean, if you ESPN is located in the heart of the heart of Connecticut, Bristol, Connecticut is a com- just, sorry, Bristol, but like it's a just a complete pile and like <laughs> but either way like it's in bristol for a good reason also impossible to get to too like everybody so who has to fly to espn in headquarters especially in the winter they're like this is absolutely atrocious miserable. i hate this miserable i worked there for two years and i lived like what should have been 15 minutes away but everything is a one lane road I, can't, I, I don't have time for it but it's in a good spot because like of the way the mountains are and the satellites blah 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 more importantly though i would be willing to to at least uh, you know to bet that like the humane nature of people who are on the committee is a little bit like yo forget this team that just gets sucked off by espn every single day because everybody at espn has probably come face to face with hurley at some point in the last couple years uh they're inviting these players all the time to come to espn they're down the road blah 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 so like there is something to this this the the mothership you know the 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 evil mothership if you will is sort of backing uconn all the time i think that just puts them in the limelight as like there there aren't that many teams that get hated after winning one championship in the last like 10 years you have to build a dynasty but we all do remember UConn either being in or winning this tournament a lot in the last like 25 years and so I mean they've won it way more times than anybody else since they won their first one for good measure at this point this in 99 was the first one and they're up to five of them like you know that, that that's that's dominance over a, a couple of decades so that's just going to you know behoove that it's not going to behoove them in, in terms of the popularity rankings people are just going to keep hating who's up top right and and that's kind of I, I, like where I'm at the, the, the most agreed just thing here to me in this whole this part of the bracket is Auburn's a top five team in the country maybe like you yeah. can easily argue that they I mean according to Kempom they have a top four adjusted efficiency right net rating essentially like what they do on both sides of the floor 
kind of feels UConn-y in a lot of ways. And there are a lot of sort of congruencies between last year's UConn team and this year's Auburn team being a four seed, being the same bracket as the, the defending champs, et cetera, et cetera. So like, I, that's the cruelest part of all this to me. I do think, you know, as good as Illinois is on offense and as good as Iowa State is on defense, I'm not scared of either of them as a UConn fan. I'm truly not scared of, of them as much as maybe I should be, but I, I don't think that Iowa State winning, first of all, I don't care about the Big 12. That's rule number one is I'm just, the, the disrespect for the Big 12 is going to remain in my brain forever. Uh, <laughs> like if you want, and honestly the Big 10 outside of like maybe the Michigans, right? Because I'm certainly not even afraid of Purdue once we get there, which if you want to talk about that, like not afraid of them, not afraid of Houston. I think the team that most likely is going to play UConn that scares me the most is Auburn. And to be honest, I'm not even thrilled about the prospect of playing FAU or Northwestern either. <laughs> like all those things are a little bit more of like these trappy feels to me. And, and Auburn does have the horses to run with UConn. So th that's where I'm at. It's it's cruel, but I don't think it was on purpose. And I'm still uh, back in my boys. Yeah. And I'm with you here too. Cause I look, the eye test tells you that UConn, the, nobody can give me a sound logical argument that if you can argue with me that Houston might be the best team in the country or this, that, or the other, you can't take UConn out of the top three conversation, period. Um, they're, they're a top three team in the country. And Klingman down low is a true five, and his size and his touch around the rim is going to give everybody problems. Um, Sonogo did it last year. You see guys like that who are absolutely elite ballers, but their position has just kind of been erased in the NBA, and that's why you see um, these guys make a deep run in the tournament because they do matter. Like having a big five in a big center who can make their free throws, protects the rim, has some touch on the glass, and comes down with boards here is, is excellent. And I, I'm with you. I don't think that the trouble lies with Iowa State. I think Illinois, if they can get their defense together just a little bit, they could make a little bit of a run here because that offense is dumb nasty. Um, but yeah, Auburn, I think, is the biggest test here. Um, and I think that Klingman just d does give Auburn too many problems with his ability to move up and down the floor. Like for his size, he's got great pace to go 94 feet. Uh, for a big man. And, and again, I bought a piece of Yukon back when I could still get them at like plus 650. They're down to like below plus 400 now. Um, and it, it, it is it's because of the eye test. It's because of the eye test. Everybody watches Yukon blow the doors off people and they're like, damn, that's the best team in the country. Yeah. And that's how it should be. And that's why I take futures positions mid season like that. I was really hoping. For them to have a bad loss yeah at some point and i just kept waiting and it never came and finally yeah. i was like this price is just going to continue to get worse because they're not going to lose a game let's buy yeah. now yeah. um so Same. yeah I, I like that a lot um we'll keep it moving into the west bracket which i again i don't have a ton to say here we already covered you know my best bets which is new mexico is a sleeper i think that's excellent uh nevada i think is a little underrated but can be home court merchants the mountain west struggles in the bracket besides sdsu's run last year um prior to that they were one in 11 all time in ncaa rounds um and you know that makes it two and two and twelve getting out of the first round in their history. Um, but yeah, I, I like Nevada here. I think the biggest takeaway for me here yeah. is this is the kind of bracket that I expected UConn to have. This right. is a layup. This is set yeah. up for North Carolina to have a cakewalk to the final four because Arizona is going to have to play a tough game eventually down there on the two seed line. And I do think Arizona is a little bit fraudulent anyway, mm -hmm. in that this North Carolina team can beat them straight up in the elite eight when it, if, yeah. if it does come down to that. So right. I think this, this is the sort of draw I expected for UConn, the reigning national champs, but I'm very glad North Carolina got a one seed in this draw because I did kind of buy in on them at the wrong point. I thought they yeah. hit a low in the middle of the season. And then they showed me, hey, we can drop that bar lower down. Yeah. But then luckily, R.J. Davis and um, 
uh, Armando Baycott figured it out. Baycott stopped getting in foul trouble and has a, been available in late game situations, which has been a huge turnaround for North Carolina. Yeah. He's grown. He's learned. I think that this is the best chance the ACC has to put somebody in the final four. And the ACC has put somebody in the final four, like 30 of the last 36 years. So yeah. this sets up great for North Carolina. Uh, I, I agree fully. The only thing I can think of, you know, and the, the committee will always fall back on this. They put North Carolina across on the other side of the country and they got UConn playing, you know, round of 64 games that they had to take a Greyhound bus to, right? They, yep. It wasn't even worth it to fly. So like there is something to that. I do think that matters for college kids. Although I will also say that UConn has always won the championship, not in the Eastern bracket. They always win, right? Usually uh, from, from coming actually out West oftentimes and, and playing a, a sort of unfair, seemingly road games against teams like SDU, SU, like Arizona, but this North Carolina fan base is going to travel. There's UNC fans living in uh, probably yeah. more of them living in, in LA than there are living in, you know, Zona fans who are still in Phoenix because the prices are worth it living in Arizona, but more importantly, right? Like for this one, I, I yeah, Baycott Im impresses the hell out of me, dude. I think he's going to be a dude that does not get picked high enough in to go to the NBA. Uh, and then will still make a massive impact when he, if, if he gets an actual shot out there, because he is someone who's fading away at times, like Kenneth Lofton Jr., for example, not really making an impact anymore in the NBA because being big and, and even being able to shoot still hasn't really worked for him. But Baycott is a, is a cerebral player, dude. I've, I've loved watching him play. Uh, and I, I think he's going to basically kind of, you know, own the paint for the majority of this, this run for UNC I agree yeah and that's why I, we'll get to it but yeah that's why I like UNC a lot this, here. Is, this is where I wanted to get I, these are my last two favorite sections of the bracket real quick because I yeah. want to know from, from from you like should I should I care about Purdue do I do I actually is this the year I actually have to believe in them um I would say at least for the first two rounds you can believe in Purdue here um, I don't think Utah State or TCU has what it takes to go and give Purdue problems. I I think Gonzaga does. I think Gonzaga's overseeded a little bit, but got yeah. the best draw humanly possible. And that's a futures bet we're going to talk about here in a second because Kansas is so beat yeah. up. This is yep. just a layup line for Gonzaga to make it to the Sweet 16, um, to make it to, to to the Elite Eight, possibly playing Purdue. Um, so I think that I think that you can be cool with Purdue until the Elite Eight, and then if this Gonzaga team looks confident and is playing good ball, that might be a little bit of an upset spot just because they can build momentum against a McNeese state who is criminally underrated, by the way. Yeah. Like yeah. they have Will Wade, who is a former yeah. LSU head coach who got fired due to recruiting violations that don't happen anymore because everybody's got NIL deals now. Right. And like that was kind of his rebirth into, hey, I'm ba allowed back on the college scene because yeah. the things I was in trouble for aren't yes. things that i can get in trouble for anymore yeah so this, it's like you got arrested just... you got arrested when weed was still illegal and then they legalized <laughs> it and let his ass out and mcneese state is going to be a good stepping stone for him i totally agree with all that about will wade he's 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 not gonna be a mcneese state for very long and, and if they make any kind of noise in this tourney like that was the only thing i was gonna say i totally agree with you about the cakewalk except for that trappy first game in the team that's going to be just playing for their lives for a coach that knows what he's doing so Brad Thomas actually had a great play on this, and he snagged it early. I don't know if the number's still around, but I, he liked the over here, and I couldn't agree with him more. I love the over here because Will Wade's team is not going to play scared. They are right. going to try and put – Gonzaga can run. Everybody knows Gonzaga yeah. can run, but they're going to try and push the pace, and they're going to try and go hoop for hoop with Gonzaga. Yeah. So – Brad caught it at like over 148 and a half. I think that's a great number. I'd probably play that up to about 150 before I have second guesses on myself there cool. and, and maybe look at, look back at it. But yeah, I love taking the over there because that's what McNeese State's going to do with Will Wade. They're just going to yeah. try and go hoop for hoop with Gonzaga. Gonzaga mm -hmm. is going to ultimately win because they have better athletes and they played tougher competition, and at least in my opinion, I don't think McNeese State is going to be the 12 upset seed. But it wouldn't yeah. surprise me when you got a coach like Will Wade. Um, right. But the, I love the over in that one. And um, in in the other part of the bracket, we already kind of hit on South Carolina. As a fellow Big East fan, I'm a big, big, big time Big East guy. 
Creighton got an excellent draw here, and Creighton yeah. has a very legitimate shot to run this out. And I, I think if they play Purdue, they give Purdue serious problems because, again, Cogburner, he's not Zach Eady, 7'4", 7'4 but he's seven one, and I think yeah. that's a guy who, even though he doesn't like, I said he doesn't always have the effort there on the glass. Um, even if he's not coming down with the rebounds, he's at least got the cake and he's got the muscle to keep Edie at bay. Even if Edie's grabbing him over the over his head, you might be getting some over the back foul calls there because. Even if he's not coming down with the rebounds, he does give a lot of box out effort. And that's where Shireman is so important is the guard who comes in and cleans up when Cockburner's busy trying to box your biggest guy out and yeah. take him away from the board. Keeping it moving from Creighton, we're going to jump into, I want to talk about this Virginia Colorado State play-in game that happened last night. Um, Virginia clearly didn't deserve to be in the tournament. They got in. Um, over Indiana State and Pitt, um, which I think was a mistake. I think Colorado State is tough, and they would have given any of those teams a challenge. But to watch Virginia get blown out by down 18, and you're still stretching the shot clock out to the final second um, in, in thinking that you can somehow defend your way out of being down 18 – um, just was awful television. Um, and I say that while I have Grambling versus Montana State going on in the background, which is a far more entertaining game than watching Virginia basketball. Always. Always and forever, man. I mean, you're, you're, they're always going to be at the top of the list of fewest possessions per game. Uh, and it just, it just reeks of like, I don't know, de almost desperation. Like if you're the team that's supposed to be, you know, as good as you're allegedly you are, then you should be bringing the action. You're, you shouldn't be the team that's sitting back and, and hoping that like the, the shot clock will basically save you because you get that many seconds per possession. Uh, it, it's just, it's sad to watch. Like it was one of those ra rare, rare, just like W's for everybody. I don't think anybody was like, what a deserving squad Virginia is. At least nowhere on my timelines was I seeing any of that be part of the conversation. So it was just sort of vindication at the end of the day. And it, something the eye test didn't pass. And as a result, the actual test of the game, they failed that as well. And and I think Colorado State, for the for the money, for the odds, now, like if you're scared to take them in your bracket for whatever reason, uh, I don't think either team's getting past Tennessee anyway. But I think if you're playing this game as an individual and you wanted to find a good money line dog, then I, I think Colorado State would be that. That, that team yeah and and i like that like you were saying earlier for the uh the draft king boost on the underdog parlay if you if you have a good feeling about colorado state i do think that this tennessee team can be gotten to just because yes they play great defense and they have a fantastic rim protector but their offense really only goes through one player like brandy was saying last night so i've feel like teams like that always do tend to struggle. And then you have the um, storyline here of Texas being the old Tennessee coach and coming in and kind of continuing the narrative of Tennessee doesn't have success in the postseason. Um, so I think that would be big if Texas could upset Tennessee there. And I think it would be awesome is somebody who has Creighton to go far in this bracket. So I, I think that is a little bit of an issue. I don't think Tennessee has a problem with St. Pete's. Like we all remember the story. St. Pete's is a dog making that six Cinderella run. But like those same kids aren't walking through the door. You don't have the same um, pull for the program. And, and you don't do that kind of twice in the same century. Yeah, totally. uh, so don't, so get, don't get like fixated on the fact that they were the same seed that they are this year. St. Pete's is only ever going to be a four. Like I think maybe once they've been a 13, but they're always going to be a 14 through 16 seed. So that's the correlation. There is not, it doesn't exist right there. That's just some hokey stuff if you want to buy it. But I mean, if you were going to take a 15 seed from the standpoint that you don't like Tennessee to make it to the 16, that kind of makes sense. You know, if you're like, well, I think Colorado State might beat them anyway. We all have, we all, nobody here is that's watching this or on this show right now has one bracket that they're filling out. So if you want to have one that you want to, you're not worried about tearing up, this is a, this is a fun part of the bracket to kind of get weird, right? Yeah, exactly. Because I think, and actually that leads us perfectly into our next section because 
I think the South is ripe for chaos. Um, me and Brandy talked about this one a lot, but this whole bottom quadrant of the South here just screams chaos to me because NC State is on a rip. They're on a heater. They are a bid stealer. This is why we're not seeing an Indiana State in the tournament. This is why, you know, you put Virginia in because they are an ACC school and they do have draw and their fans will travel. But NC State winning out the ACC, because they're not dancing if they don't win out the ACC, kind of stole a bid from an at-large team. I do think, again, I'm not going to harp on the committee too much, but like, I think that just putting Virginia in and making us watch that brand of basketball was just super unfortunate because even though I don't think Pitt is all that good, they at least don't put you to sleep when you're watching the game, you know, yeah. like watching Pitt, they can score, they play right. fast, they hoop. Um, so even if you weren't an Indiana state guy and you wanted to replace Virginia with a like for like swap, for yep. somebody in the ACC to have like the pull and the, the name draw, it should have been Pitt because Pitt doesn't make you feel like you took a fucking Xanax bar and fell asleep on the couch watching TV. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I do uh, know what you're saying. I do know <laughs> what you're saying. And I, I, I wonder, you know, I don't want to say that there's any sort of other motives that go into putting a team like NC State in the bracket at the end of the day i mean it's it doesn't apply to this situation but i'm on t like pretty much 100 percent of the time i'm like just put the mid-major in dude like don't yeah. tell me that these kids can't play against you know the bottom uh half of uh, of these major conferences like it, it, it it's not the same anymore with with especially with nil deals but even more importantly just like the idea that you don't have to play you, know, you can get on espn plus your mixtape is just as important you're going to have an opportunity to get invited places because even coaches have access so I'm, I'm i'm with all of that i think the 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 bet here for uh the, the nc state texas one is another situation of like yeah no i'm i'm good with the the favorite here but I, if, if i were gonna actually like lay money on this game i'm not let's just put it that way i don't i don't really have a, a, a strong lean on this one either way and i don't think either of these teams get past kentucky that's for sure yeah, I think Texas Tech, uh, my biggest problem with Texas Tech is, again, in the Big 12, like, everybody's building super tough. You also have, like, five in-state rivalries in Texas now in the Big 12 with Houston, Texas Tech, Baylor. Yeah. Um, who else is down there? Well, Texas is gone now. They're going to you got the a &M. Uh, yeah, you got AM. Well, they're they're SEC too, but like oh, I thought you were talking um, about Texas. I just thought you were just talking about Texas teams. Yeah, no, I mean, but like, dude, there's there's like five in-state rivalries now in just the state of Texas got, with yeah, yeah. uh TCU in the Big 12. Like right. there's so many Texas teams and they do all beat up on each other. And again, this is another little home court merchant kind of thing because all of their buildings are insanely tough to play in. Right, right. I do think Texas Tech plays a fun brand of basketball, though. If you like small ball, they got three guards who can absolutely oh, shoot the lights out yeah, of any shooter, building yeah. they step on the floor for. Um, their problem is foul trouble. Those smaller guards do tend to get in a lot of foul trouble because they do have to work extra hard on the glass and uh, and try and come up with some rebounds to stop runs. So yeah. I think that's interesting. Kentucky is another team that I, I tend to agree with Brandy here. I'm not saying that Oakland is going to be able to upset them outright, but the Horizon League does play better basketball than people give them credit for. Again, mm -hmm. like you said, um, I watch a ton of Horizon League ball because it's on ESPN Plus, and I just think Tuesdays and Wednesdays for college basketball are really nice slates with the Horizon League, with the MAC, with the Big 12, and with the Big East. You know, of the 35 to 45 games you get on Tuesday and Wednesday nights, those are fun matchups to watch. They don't play a ton of defense. These teams score a ton of points. And for anybody not in the know, I know Josh is because he lives in Oakland, California. <laughs> this Oakland team is not from California. This Correct. team is just outside of Detroit. Like, this is a Michigan team. Um, so this is Midwest. Um, but, yeah, I think that number's long for a Kentucky team who's just trash on defense. So yeah. I think that catching almost 14 points with Oakland here – who played a ton of tournament teams tough. I mean, they played Illinois within 10 or 11 points. They challenged themselves with their non-conference schedule, and so did Indiana State and, and 
again, it's a shame they didn't get in because, you know, I don't want to keep harping on it and coming back to it, but Indiana State is the highest mid-major net ranking team ever to be left out of the tournament. And I think that's why people are so pissed about it. So yeah. I can see Oakland covering a, a very long number here, but Kentucky's one of those teams that is a borderline NBA team. Like they're going to have two or three guys that might go in the lottery. Same with Duke. Um, and just, they can drop 120 on you, but they also might give up 118 just like Alabama does. And at some point there's a diminishing return on playing with your foot standing wide open on the throttle and scoring that many points. If you can't get a defensive stop. Yeah. Yeah. And that put, that does put pressure on the offense for sure. I think the, the ability for multiple players to get their own shot on Kentucky is one reason I look at them in, in the tourney. Now, obviously, you know, we're talking about kids, uh, right? Like we're talking about young kids that are not necessarily experienced in this type of situation where things just tighten up a ton. So I, I can see that. I, I I do like Marquette a bit in that conference, I, I, in, in this region rather. My, my thing here too is just like, wh why would we believe in Houston? I, I, my, my main thing here is like, if you're going to, you can't be in a bottom, like basically but like what the 10th percentile of free throw shooting percentage. Yeah. You, you can't, you, you can't be that bad at it in this time of year. I love defense. I don't think you can name me a team and I don't, and I, Virginia doesn't count either. That's <laughs> won the championship based on defense alone. Like that, they, that you have to have dudes that can get their own buckets at this point in time to make an NBA comp. Jokic will always be better than Embiid because his team is going to get a bucket at the, whenever they need it. When it's like nut crunching time, for lack of a better way to say it, that's that's when you want those, you know, that's when you want your offense to actually be capable more, even just as much as your defense. So that's where I come to with this one. If they if they do find themselves, Kentucky specifically, not making shots, I do think that they're in trouble for Houston. I don't think that they have the like they have to get to the rim. What happens when they do get up against one of these teams like even even Florida, anybody that can really defend uh, down low a bit more like what happens if you face somebody like that, right? I love that you bring that up because I think this Marquette team is super ripe for an upset. And I'll tell you why it's because Tyler Kalik has an oblique injury and we're not sure whether or not he's going to be able to go for this entire tournament. And Marquette's already thin. They lost their six man who was probably going to win six man of the year back in January. So a Marquette team that doesn't play a ton of bench minutes as is, is already going to struggle if Kalik is not going to be on the floor and Kalik um, is one of the better guards they have for a young team. Again, this is young Marquette. Um, I, I know Oso is, is everybody's key here, but I think if Florida can get past Boise State or Colorado, um, that Florida has a very legitimate chance to cause a ton of chaos here because Florida does very well at what Marquette does piss poor, and that's rebound. Florida rebounds like their hair's on fire and like they know that every rebound is the difference between a win and a loss. Marquette has a very lackluster effort on both ends of the floor on the glass, but especially on the offensive end. So if Florida's going to out-rebound you on the defensive end and completely wax you on the offensive glass and get all those second point the chance point opportunities where Florida is very good. They have very great guard play. Um, and now they did lose a seven foot one rim protector to a horrible injury, but that guy was already trending, not playing as many minutes. And I, I think this Florida team is still very strong. I'm glad the kid's okay. I'm glad he made it out of surgery because it, it was a bad injury that, you know, it, it wasn't Kevin Ware where his leg came out of the inside of Just his body name, yeah. with a compound fracture. But um, yeah, I mean, it was a bad one and it, and it was concerning, but that also gives me confidence in Florida because now you want to go out and win it for your boy who's laid up. So I think if they get past Colorado slash Boise State here, they give Marquette a ton of problems, and we'll get to it um, at the end because I have a position on that, and, and I yeah. think we have a very good number on that. Yeah, um, let's do it. Talking about the top of the bracket, the the reason I agree, because uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I've been shit-talking Houston all season. 
unfortunately, they just happen to get a bracket that draws out very well for them. Because Longwood stands absolutely no chance against Houston. Like, uh, it's, and it's not just because they're a 16 seed, but like, Longwood doesn't match up at all against them, period. Um, I talked about how I, I've been talked into Nebraska and I bought into the Nebraska team. They're not going to beat Houston. They have no chance. Like the defense they play with Nebraska's inability to shoot, especially away from their building and on a neutral site. Like, I don't think they give Houston any problems. I'm not worried about Scani. I actually have them losing in the bracket in a couple of brackets. I have two James Madison. I think Duke does give Houston a tough matchup. Now, Duke's problem is they have a newer coach, an interim kind of guy um, that hasn't been here and hasn't had the same kind of coaching experience. And Houston is deep. They have a lot of deep three-man rotations that they do well. But Duke actually does have the defense here that can give Houston problems by guarding the perimeter letting them have whatever kind of mid-range game they want. And they know that if you foul Duke or if you foul Houston and do it hard and make them kind of second guess themselves at going to the rim, that it's going to be a tough day. The unfortunate thing is if, if Florida or Kentucky somehow runs out and, and is able to face Houston, that might be a good matchup, but I don't think anybody coming out of the bottom of this bracket is going to give Houston too much trouble because again I think it's going to be chaos down there and anybody who they're going to be a walking corpse you're going to be a walking wounded of we played a gauntlet of upsets in teams that had way more spark than we gave them credit for and then you're going to run into a Houston team who who can flat out hoop. like I'll be honest with you so yeah I can see Houston making the final four here I I I think it'll be interesting when we get into this next category here of who in the final four gives Houston problems because um, jumping back to it real quick here, the Midwest, I think that if Gonzaga comes out of here, I don't think they give Houston a ton of problems. If Creighton comes out of here, I do think they can um, maybe give Houston some problems. But, um, yeah, th this might set up for a UConn-Houston finals matchup. This might set up well for, you know, I, I like UConn and I like UNC both coming out of the left side of the bracket here. So, I think UConn or UNC both set up to give Houston a hell of a game in the championship that we'll be all excited to watch because... Yeah, if, if Duke's not the one to do it, I think Houston does have kind of a cakewalk here to the Final Four, and I think that's why you got such a short number on their odds. Yeah, And I do think Houston's proved themselves this year because um, the, the, the whole thing with Houston is, you know, they were playing in, um, shoot, was it the A-10? Whatever conference it was with memphis they're in the a they were in the aac for a second weren't they the aac that's right yes yeah. yeah, so yeah. they were in the aac and they just moved to the big 12. houston's proved that they can hang with the oh, big yeah. boys and yeah. even though you might think that the big 12 is a little bit overinflated, yeah it is murderers row i mean yeah. even in a down year with kansas with how well iowa state's playing um, you know, I know Baylor's young and their their freshman guard, who's an absolute stud, is just always in foul trouble, which is why you see him come off the floor with like, you know, 10 to eight minutes left in the first half. And you see Houston dig themselves a 22 point grave yeah. that it takes the final six minutes of when he's on the floor for them to dig themselves out of foul trouble. So yeah. Um, I think it sets up great. I think that there's going to be a lot of chaos and a ton of fun to be had in this bracket this season. So, yeah. Um, if you want, if if you want to throw out a couple of Final Four predictions or some championship predictions, it's more than welcome to it. Let's do that, and then we'll get into the, like the futures bets, and we'll wrap it, and and we'll call it. I want to say a season, but we'll call it the start of the tournament because I yeah. won't be having any more video content until. Next week, when we start talking Sweet 16, Elite yep. 8 matchups, um, because I am going to kind of check out. Like, you can find me on Twitter, or you can find me in the Discord, where I'll be throwing plays in. But, yeah, mostly I'm going to go drink beer with my homies and watch a ton of <laughs> basketball for the next four days. Hell yeah.
So I'll, I'll give you my final four before uh, you just you just say yours. I'll just show you mine and then you show me yours. Um, <laughs> but I, I am, you know, I, I, I hate that I'm, I am taking a big 10 team, but I'm, I am taking a chalk in terms of Purdue in that sense. Yeah. Uh, I, I disagreed with you about Marquette and I, I give them credit as a, a, a team that, like I said, I'm clearly prioritizing, first of all, biggest cliche every year in March, guard play, senior guard yeah. play, <laughs> experienced guard play. That is always going to be something we you hear people say, uh, and I, I'm buying into it with Marquette. I think that they're, they're, they're battle tested is another thing, another cliche, but they have gone through their own gauntlet, right? In that big East. And people really thought they were going to have you kind of run for their money. The only thing is UConn does everything Marquette could want to do just as well as that, right? That to me, like it, you, you're going to have to have, a, you're going to have to be a lot better on defense, first of all, because they can get up and down the floor and score. And But I right. think that's what I, I clearly prioritize when I'm talking about brackets at this point in the year. Like I'm just going to, my, my most trusted bracket is going to be filled with teams that I think aren't going to get rattled when you need a bucket. And there's just too many dudes that can bring it for Marquette at this point to get them that bucket. Um, so I, I am taking them, and like like I said, you know, I don't have the biggest respect for for Houston at this point. Uh, right. And it, it, when when it comes out to the uh, to the West, I really really did want to take uh, St. Mary's to make a little bit of a run. I also like taking a, a team like Alabama because of the fact that I think at times that there was a consensus that they were like a, a Final Four worthy team for a lot of the season, especially the, uh, you know for the, around the middle of it. But like at this point, uh, I think I am going chalk on that side with with UNC as well. And then lastly, I mean, I've got three number ones because I do think this is a year that's a little bit more ripe for chalk as well because of the fact that you look at the teams at the top, I think they are much better than the teams at the top last season. A lot of the numbers would indicate it as well, right? Like there's like the the top offensive teams in the league right now would all be like, num I think three of them would be number one last season in terms of offensive efficiency. A lot of teams would be ranked way lower than they were last year in, in, in both offensive and defensive efficiency in some places. I'm banking on the, the teams that can score to be the ones that can get there. So I got UConn in the chip. I have them beating Purdue. It's the chalkiest of chalk. Uh, and that, but, but it's like, that, that's my one that I'm, I've got the most riding on essentially. Yeah. And there's no shame in that because like I said, I'll, we'll get to it here. I have a future on UConn that I bought in the middle of the season. Cause every time I watch a UConn game, I'm like, fuck, this is the best team in the country. Like this, is, there's nobody stopping these boys, especially Klingman down low. Like I, I, I have a lot of respect for that kid. Um, and I have a lot of respect for any big five who stays in college knowing that his position's just kind of not there in the NBA. Like, you have yeah. the option to go overseas and play ball if you want to do that, but yeah. I, I also don't think that Klingman's hard up with an NIL deal, hanging out on UConn's campus, walking around, because you can't miss him. He's gigantic, him. and he's the man everywhere he steps foot on campus. Everybody wants to dab him up give him high fives and tell him how good the team is. And like yep. that feeling makes you want to stay and play college ball instead of going over to like Spain or yeah. um, any of those other European countries where it's like, you might be good and people might recognize you, but you also got to play FIBA rules, which are just a slightly bit different. And yeah. um, you know, you got to learn a new language and, and there's a lot more travel involved and you're away from friends and family. So I get the draw. And, and I also think that's why Edie stay, like, has stayed in the NCAA is so so yeah. long because you got these NIL deals and your position doesn't really exist in the NBA. So why get in a big hurry to go overseas and play when you just have a ton of extra eligibility in NIL deals? So I can completely see the UConn and Purdue making it here and squaring off in the championship game. Yeah. I, like I said, I think North Carolina has a lay-in. I think the West is a really soft draw for them. Um, I'm not – I can't – I just can't get behind a team like Baylor. Like, I would love to give you a three seed that I think could come out. Right. And for me, it's going to end up being Creighton. I think Creighton might be the team that does it. Um, it – and I just I can't I can't buy into a Baylor team that starts every game in a 25 point hole. Like, yep. Yeah, that's um, a problem. So I'll keep it moving there. I, I do think Houston ends up coming out of that bracket, like I said. Um, so we'll we'll jump into these futures plays because I, yeah. I do really like a lot of these positions. 
UNC, oh, yeah. UNC, I bought in the middle of the season, trying to buy a buy low spot um, because I thought they were a great team. They did end up, you know, playing worse basketball, and I could have probably gotten this at a much better number at like 25 or 30 to one when they were at rock bottom, but they played their way back into competition and they got a soft one seed draw. And the same number I bought mid season is now the number you can get North Carolina at and 17 to one is a really good number for a team. Like I said, who's got a really soft bracket. And I think that there's not a lot of teams there that give them problems. Like Alabama, I don't think plays enough defense to go hoop for hoop with North Carolina because North yeah. Carolina has the offense to go hoop for hoop, but they can at least get a stop when they desperately need a stop. Yeah. And I don't, you know, again, I don't care how many transition threes you hit in somebody's face. Like eventually you got to be able to make something that's not a breakaway transition three right. and UNC can do it. Whereas Alabama, I just don't think can They yeah. do make free throws. Well, and I, I'll give them credit. Alabama looks great on a spreadsheet, but when I watch them on the floor, they just don't have it for me. Yeah, and that's that that that's that's why I, I like that was the team I wanted to take as the sort of like we forgot, we all forgot, but did we forget as much as like you said on on in a box score you're going to see some names on the roster and be like, damn, as an individual player, yeah. But yeah, to your point, when they get on the floor, like it's it's either fast break or the half court offense just looks stagnant because they, they can't necessarily use their athleticism at that point. So um, I, I'm with you on that because I really wanted to, to find somebody else besides UNC. But I I, I do have a, maybe a little bit of the recency bias of watching them just handle Duke, like handled them, dude. Like there was yep. never a doubt. It got a little bit hairy for a little bit. Other than that, those little those few minutes, it was like, dude, even in that time frame, they are in control. Uh, with their two stars so yeah I, I it's just tough for me to to, to to I just can't see it is, is really what it comes down to and it, the two seeds don't inspire like especially Zona in that part of the the, the bracket so yeah I, I think it's going to be a final four for UNC and from there you'd love to have a 17 to 1 for that with them sitting as the last four so I, I dig it that was a good that was a good look in the season for you thank you and then yeah like I said I picked up this piece of UConn in the middle of the season because look the eye test tells me they're the best team in the country I know how hard it is to run it back to back but it plus 650 I was fine taking that number there I saw it at plus 800 and I was like oh should I take them maybe they'll get a bad loss because they had like Creighton or somebody coming up on the schedule and they absolutely pounded them by like 18 points and then I looked the next day I'm like well there goes an extra dollar fifty of value. I can't watch it go down anymore. Right. Let's just buy them now. I would absolutely. I'll, I'll tell you right now, though. Even with a boost, there's no chance I'd put money on UConn at three to one. You're gonna right. get. You're gonna make more money because what? You got to win five games to win the championship, yeah. right? Just put a hundred dollars. Like if your unit's a hundred bucks, put right. whatever your unit is. On the money on line game. and roll it over five times, yeah. you'll get better than three to one because yeah. they're going to run into a team that they're going to actually be like, you know, they'll still probably be the favorites, but they'll be like minus 145 on the money right. line. Right. And if you've gotten three or four rollovers since then, yeah. even if they're, you know, minus 20,000 yeah. and minus, you know, 650, like that yeah. spare change you pick up on the rollover is going to be better than buying in. In yeah, anything that's number. like three to one right now it's, it's it's such a it's such a common thing like so i i take all my futures like in the nba where i, I have all like the heaviest amount of units all of those get made before like the last one i make is well i had to hit the nuggets at plus 450 it was like <laughs> it was the same thing as uconn for you i was like is anybody else watching this team and thinks that there's another team close to as good as them am i taking insanity pills at the celtics because they blow out the pistons and and these crappy bottom feeders and sometimes good teams but it's the regular season. So I, I'm, I'm, it's the same concept here for UConn. And, and then by the time you get to the postseason, it's like, no, this is now where you just roll it over, bro. And you get a lot more chances in, in the uh, the NBA, obviously, to do that with the amount of freaking games at this point in the playoffs. Um, but you can still you'll still get the value of three W's rolling over a money line bet rather than playing that that one, you know, one team to win five games in a row at three to one, like you said. Yeah. So this, this is my favorite part of the new betting landscape is these futures to make the round of 16, 
to make the Elite Eight because, like we talked about, there are some soft spots in this bracket where I think are ripe for upsets. And I used a lot of my boosts on it this week because I am just, I'm a nerd. I, I sit here and I nerd out on college basketball. And this has been one of the most exciting weeks for me. So yeah. the more and more I looked at it, I think that, um, you know, Kansas with their injury issues, and even if Samford beats them, I think this Gonzaga team is just too good to go down to somebody like that. And, uh, you know, I, I want to say it's like plus 135 or plus 140 unboosted, but you give me a 64% boost on DraftKings that I can get a full half unit of my, my normal bet down on. And I just need Gonzaga to win two games at plus 221 to beat a um, McNeese State team who, again, is coached by Will Wade, but, like, they should beat. And yeah. an injury-riddled Kansas team, if they even make it that far, yeah, give me Gonzaga. Like, again, plus 220. I think that's just way too long of a number uh, for this team to win two games. Yeah, I agree. I'm not, I wouldn't be scared of that matchup for them either in the four or five. So, taking having them to basically win the next round at plus 221, I, I'm fully on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think even if they do face Kansas or um, Sanford, like yeah. you're not going to get that price on their money line. No, like, you're not going to be dogs. And if they are playing Kansas and the public's all over it because they don't know about, you know, Kansas's injury issues. Right. Then you're, they're still not going to be such underdogs that you'll get plus two twenty one. So right. again, this is the po- this is the point I'm trying to make is there's the the values here. It's not in the money line rollover for two games. It's in this futures position, and that's yeah. why I boosted it, and that's why I took it. Same thing here with New Mexico. Again, I think Clemson is booty cheek soft. Um, I, you know, you can't lose three of your four games going into the tournament against unranked teams. Boston College is the only team that I even give a little bit of credit to because they are scrappy in the ACC. But like Notre Dame's ass and has been ass all season and you lose to them. Um, you know, Wake Forest, who I thought you should have beat because I was sick of hearing, oh, Wake Forest is on the bubble and they hadn't won a single road game all season. So like, again, Clemson here is soft. It's right for an upset. And again, if they play Baylor, who I think Colgate still can give Baylor a game, Baylor's freshman guard, who is the backpack of that offense, doesn't have a great amount of discipline and gets in too much fall trouble early. And I can easily see Baylor digging themselves into a hole that they can't shoot their way out of against this New Mexico team, who I think is very disrespected as an 11. Like I said, they borderline meet the criteria for Ken Palm rankings to be a national champion. Um, so this unboosted is plus 250 over on FanDuel, which I thought was a great price by itself. But then before we recorded the show, I'm looking on MGM. They tossed me another 64% boost. I can get this at plus 410. Are you kidding me? Even yeah. if they go up against Baylor, I'm getting a massive buyout value here after yeah. beating Clemson. Right. And like I said, I'm already on New Mexico minus two. So this is a double dip. If you're not into that, God bless you. Don't take... The minus two versus Clemson then, because I cannot stress how much value I think this New Mexico team has just to win two games. As an 11 seed, plus 410 with your boost here. And it's it's a it's a decent sized boost. I couldn't get a full half unit down, but I got 0.4 units. 20 bucks is that that goes a long way on a plus 410. You know, you're netting a a hundred back. So yeah, 100 percent. And then last one I want to talk about, and I I know you like Marquette, but I think that there's just a ton of value here on a Florida team who was the runner up in the SEC tournament, who we already made a killing on, on a buyout position, because I, let's be honest, we, I knew Auburn was going to beat the brakes off of them. Um, And if they played Tennessee, which I'm glad they didn't, I still thought we were going to get a decent buyout number on them, but you know, I, I think this is a big bounce back spot for Florida who did just lose one of their guys. So this is kind of a do it for the Gipper kind of deal. Um, do it for your homie who's laid up. 
come out here, make some noise. And, and I think I told you that Florida just matches up well against Marquette because the two things that Florida does great that Marquette does poor or one thing that does, Marquette does poorly is they don't they don't get after the glass and Florida are complete savages on the glass. And Florida is incredibly good at defending the above the break in transition three. And that's why they've beaten Alabama twice now. They And they've beaten a bunch of teams who they can swing above their weight class against. And I know I backed Kentucky to beat Florida. Um, and then Florida turned around and they smacked Kentucky in the mouth in Kentucky's own building after, um, you know, they went to overtime with Kentucky in the swamp and Kentucky skated that money line out by like, I think it was a single point. So, and, th- and this is back in January too. Like this Florida team has been cooking at the right time and they've been looking hot. Um, and they've been getting it from kind of not their star players. Every guy on the bench, when their number has been called, has been like, oh, it's my time to shine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that I represent Florida in the swamp well, and they have. So I think this Florida team's really dangerous. And I think that plus 305 with an injured Marquette team, especially, like I said, if you don't see um, Tyler Kolek in the lineup, you're going to get a fantastic buyout number on on this and even if tyler cole leak is in the lineup i still think you get a great buyout number on this yeah that's that's it's a great look always with the the ability to buy out in that um I, I i do love marquette you're right but as i even brought up with with florida it would be a team that scare me especially if they were to run on it be the team to run into houston i don't think that would be as easy as maybe no, normal one seven matchups would normally be um so i i'm with you on that with with the florida love in this one starting out with the florida love and kind of moving it on to the end as well we're bookending with all the florida love we were talking about the 05 06, uh, and 06 07 yeah. teams with all that so uh, not quite reminiscent of having like four NBA players on a starting lineup, but uh, still the ability to, to defend in, in most key areas at this point in the season. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm with that. But like I said, the, the, the bracket that I care about the most is the one Marquette, and I'll probably throw it, make it a little bit messier down there uh, in, in a separate one. Nice. Before we get out of here, I do got to drop the plugs. Obviously, um, I'm here with Josh. So like and subscribe to the Land Your Bets channel. It's easy. You're watching it here right now. So like, just just do it. Just hit the buttons. Um, I will be back with Champions League content for sure, uh, which we've been dusting everybody on player props when it comes to Champions League. Um, it's It's been a fantastic watch. We got the round of eight coming back here um, in late March, early April. Um, and then we'll be back next week. We'll try and get a video or we'll definitely get a video out for at least the Sweet 16. Um, uh, we might maybe take a couple of futures plays or positions. It depends on what the sportsbook's offering, but I'm not even going to try and predict what we're going to be doing next week because this is madness. The point of madness is to see upsets. Like the, the, the guys you'll see that go and throw there, there's going to be people who throw a hundred bucks on every money line dog here in the first round, because yep. you really only need like four or five long shots to win, to be not profitable on that. Yeah. And for me, I don't like blind betting, but it's a strategy that's been paying out a lot for yep. the last four or five tournaments in a row. So, yeah. So if that's your thing, go ahead. I'm not going to, I'm not going to shame you on that. It's just not my thing. I don't like to blindly bet. Um, because I watch a lot of hoops I, I, yeah. and I know a lot about these teams. So, yeah. um, I, I like to challenge myself and I like to try and find the money line dogs or the upsets and in, in the longer, the longer stuff that that's for me, that's the fun in the game of handicapping is yeah. challenging yourself because it's really easy to sit up here and take a bunch of chalk picks and tell everybody how much you like the one seeds. Um, it really takes a set of cojones on you to, to sit here and tell tell you why Creighton as a three seed is dangerous and might be able to make the finals. Yep, 100%. I, f- I feel it, man. Awesome. Well, that's it. I know we ran long again. I'm sorry. I get lost in the sauce when we talk brackets. Like, and, and I feel like it's everybody's favorite time of the year to sit down and chop it up. So I'm going to call it there. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you, Josh, for joining me. Um, looking forward to talking to you guys next week. Good luck with all your bets. Good luck with your brackets. That is talking hoops with Oaks. We out. Oaks.